Welcome to the Jimbo and Jeff podcast. Never have you known such cringing terror. The Jimbo and Jeff podcast. Now, here's Jimbo and Jeff. Hello. 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 Jimbo and Jeff. We're available anywhere you get your favorite podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can go to jimboandjeff.com or even YouTube and subscribe to Jimbo and Jeff. Hit that bell button to be notified any time that we do some new content, including cool videos like this today with a very special guest. Check it out. I guess I'm older, and it's harder when you're older to begin. The conversation you are referring to has not yet happened for me. I must investigate the future and find out what I meant. If you've turned your TV on any time over the last few years, you've seen this guy. He's a two-time Tony winner, star of stage and of screen, and an all-around nice guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Cerverus. Yeah, okay, yeah. there he is. There he is. And and let me let's let, let, let me say this before we get started. Um, cuz Jimbo, you were I, Hi Michael, I'm Jeff. Nice to meet hey, you. Jeff. Nice to meet you too. Um excellent Jimbo. Sure. I thank you. I am not uh, my wife and my girls. They watch TV. I'm more of a book reader. However, Jimbo, he'll go through these phases where, hey Jeff, I'm 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 watching Breaking Bad. You gotta watch it. You gotta gotta watch it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, Jim, thanks. But when I heard you were coming on, I was like, oh, you mean the Fringe? Fringe? <laughs> and he. Yes. And I said, oh my gosh, no, because Michael, I got to admit to you, um, that it, it's a little bit, I mean, I, I don't know if you could draw parallels, but it's, a, you know, James Spader's in Blacklist. Right. And he's got, but you, there's a scene where September, I don't know, is it September or Observer? You're an Observer, but you're called September. Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm his not, name is September. Now I'm sucked in. I finally got sucked in, Jimbo. Now I, I can't, I, I'm watching all these clips. Anyway, I watch you eat this hamburger. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was the, I think it was the fourth episode. It was called yeah. The Arrival. And it was like the first big episode about where you started to learn who September was. I'd shown up like just in little kind of, 30 seconds or less 10 second little snippets before that and this was the first time when you it wasn't even a hamburger it was a it was a bunch of jalapenos on on this sandwich and i put all this tabasco sauce and pepper and everything else yeah yeah but you've got she the the lady says to you is that korean you're writing or something like, yeah, something uh -huh. like that and you turn and you go no <laughs> And you've, oh my gosh, I, we're not, we're not easily frightened, but that character, <laughs> that character, and then you pour Tabasco and I'm so, I, when I saw you do that, I, I go, I hope he knows what he's doing because if, if Tabasco is Louisiana and that's down set and you sure enough, you just poured it on there. Then you dump the jalapenos and you already dumped the whole pepper on it. Right. And then you eat the whole thing. Yeah. And then, I don't know if you ever caught this. I caught it today when I was watching it. You're doing all this, and you're just glued to your character. And in the background, they're playing Willie Nelson's Crazy. It was actually Patsy <laughs> Cline's Crazy, but yeah. Willie Nelson is singing that. And I caught it, and I go, I wonder if he ever caught that. But anyway, yeah. That, that, oh, yeah. I'm like, yes. Well, well, and I have two other. A, Willie Nelson actually wrote Crazy, which I didn't know. Patsy Cline was, you know, the one who really made it famous. Never knew that. I, I never realized that Willie Nelson actually wow. wrote it. And then the other thing is, because of that scene, I actually am in the Tabasco Museum down in uh, in Louisiana. They have a, and it's a great. It's a, if you're ever traveling through Louisiana, um, it's it's kind of it's near Lafayette, sort of a little west of New Orleans. Um, but you can go and you can visit the factory and you can visit the plant and stuff, but they have this museum and they have all these uh, Tabasco artifacts and stuff. And they also have this continuing, continuously running uh, video that has all the times that Tabasco has shown up in famous movies and c commercials and stuff and TV shows. And so, and I was walking through and I just, you know, happened to be there and I was going through it and I saw the thing and I thought, 
Oh, that's funny. I wonder, you know, I can't imagine they would ever even know that it was on this one clip in this TV series. And, you know, and sure enough, I sat through <laughs> the whole thing and saw, saw myself there. So that's one of my biggest, proudest claims to fame that I actually am in the Tabasco Museum. Michael, well, I'm sucked in now. I'm, I'm sorry, Jimbo. I'm sucked in now. I'm going to watch the entire um, uh, on YouTube. But it is that scene there is, I mean, you have got, and that was J.J. Abrams, I That's believe. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Jimbo, take it. What, Michael, what is your connection with Louisiana? Well, I moved down there. I went down there to do a movie, um, Cirque de Freak, The Vampire's Assistant. Um, um, and I just fell in love with the place and made the kinds of friends that, you know, you meet these people and you'll meet everybody you ever need to meet in town. Um, and I loved the time that I spent working there. It was not very long after Katrina. So there was a lot of work to do. And I got really involved volunteering and helping build houses with uh, Habitat for Humanity and teaching in some of the, the local art schools and stuff. Um, I just loved it. And so I would come down every chance I got and spend time down there and eventually scrape the money together to get a little place down there. So that's kind of my home when I don't, when I'm not working someplace else, that's, that's where I am most of the time now. Yeah. You, uh, in your Tony acceptance speech, that was the first line, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I said, who dat? And I said, I said, there were a lot of people in, in New Orleans that you made really happy who dat. And <laughs> When I in the press room afterwards, they were all like, "So what? What did you say?" And there was one uh, guy from CBS who was from New Orleans also, and he said, "He said who that? You don't know what that is." <laughs> <laughs> now that was the acceptance speech for your Tony Award for your work in Fun Home, and that's where I met you. It's almost weird. Jeff and I were just talking about this. He had back surgery five years ago. It was five years ago that you and I met with Peggy in in New York. Yeah, yeah. And right. uh, now, was that before or after the Tonys? Um, when, when you guys were there? Yeah. Do you remember? I don't. Because when... I know the show went... What, what time? Do you remember what time of year it yeah, was? It was June. That was, it was, that it was, was June, like, oh, June That's 1st. right. It was like around two, in 2015, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, June... June 1st, like the Tonys are in June, but usually like around the 8th or the 9th. So you were probably there like the week before, like the run up to it, which is just the craziest time because you're got to do your show like always because you've got a ton of Tony voters in every night, but you also have to do all these extra things and make appearances and, and uh, you know, extra performances and stuff. And, and then there's just the general stress and anxiety of that whole time. So by the time you get to Tony night, you know, you would, you would like it if they read your name, but really mostly you just want the whole thing over with. So you can just go back to doing your job normally. Right. right. And not only that, you actually perform during the Tonys as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that year, um, the category I was in is near the end of the night. So you have to go and get all dressed up and all done up to, you know, do the red carpet and all that. And then you go sit and, you know, chew on your fingernails for a while through the early awards. And then they take you out of your seat and they take you back and you get changed and get into your costume and everything to do your number, which for that year, I was lucky because it was, they did ring of keys, which Sydney Lucas, the young girl who played um, Allison, sang really and i i literally read the newspaper during <laughs> during the number so my job at the tonys on national television live was just basically to sit there wear a wig and read the paper and um which was about all i was capable of doing at that point probably and then you go back and they put you back in your nice clothes and and you know powder your head in my case and uh, and send you back out really about 5 or 10 minutes before the award uh, is is done. So it's a whirlwind, the whole thing. Now, I have to say that uh, where uh, Fun Home took place in, in New York, in the, the theater, Circle in the Round. Circle in the Square. Yeah, yeah Circle in the Square, that's right. Um, I can't begin to tell you how nice that was because it was so intimate, how small it was. Yeah. Um, and I've always heard about the spit zone. Uh, and we were in it. We were the second row back from, you had a scene in front of the, uh, the lavatory. So I guess it's in the, oh, yeah. 
So we were right there, and I'm like, oh, we've been, oh, I know right where you were now. <laughs> we've, we've been anointed. The Smith Zone is true. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you know, not to not to bring it all down, but that's that's the reason why it's going to be really hard to reopen Broadway, you know, yeah. for a long time because there there we really are that close, and there is that much connection between the audience and not to mention the other actors you know i i'm i'm a little famous for people you know conductors wanting to wear umbrellas when i pass too near the edge of the stage over them oh, well my. michael i'll throw this at you um i told my wife you were coming on and and uh about a year and a half two years ago now she took the girls and went on a girls trip up to new york and they went and saw their favorite play cats uh-huh and uh he, she goes don't tell him that he'll laugh at that so no. there you go i got that out of the way yes they yeah, i i saw the original cats years ago and i dated a girl who's in cats so i had you know i had i have fond memories of of cats and fond associations and what was cool is they hung out after the production and they took a bunch of pictures with the mm-hmm. it was great they loved it that like on the stage with them in costume the stage, and stuff yeah came, yes that's nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, one of the wonderful things about theater and Broadway, you know, the, there's this whole culture of um, the autograph line at the stage door, stage adoring and, um, and people, actors, some actors uh, enjoy it. Some actors just tolerate it. And some actors have a, a tough time doing it, but, um, but you get to have that kind of up close and personal experience with the people that you've just seen perform for you. And, and then just being in the same room and knowing that you're in the same room, even if it's one of those big theaters where like Wicked's theater, where if you're in the back row, you're like a football field away, but you still know you're in the same room with these people that you, you know, are admiring. And, um, and that's, that's the essence of what that experience is. That's why it's different from movies and TV and, um, and those very things are going to be the hardest things to come back from. So um, it's, it's one reason why theaters aren't even in the conversation of like, you know, which phase they're going to open up in. It's like basically when the world is close to normal again. So it's, uh, it's uh, the, this whole period is not going to be over for, for performing artists for a long time. And, uh, and it's it's really tough because that's that's your heart and soul is is that interaction between people. So they're figuring out clever alternative ways to 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 fill the time now. But uh, but hopefully we'll figure out ways to protect the the casts and and artists and theaters so that they're able to to open again and and keep them going in the meantime. Is there a uh, a group organization for relief for actors and stuff? There are. There's the Actors Fund is um, does remarkable work just in normal times, and it's not just specifically for actors. It's really for anybody, including ushers or anybody who works in the in the performing arts. Um, they do a lot of work. Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS has expanded their mission over the years to um, all kinds of uh, financial and, and other assistance. Um, so they've been working over time. But, but it's interesting. I was just saying this to somebody the other day. I, I was on a, um, a, like a Zoom town hall thing yesterday from the Screen Actors Guild, from SAG, talking about the, the plans and, and protocols for opening up sets to go, for people to go back to work. Um, and I'm a little fortunate that my career since Fun Home, really, in the last five years, has really moved into TV and film more. So um, I have a job, an HBO series that's supposed to start up. Now it looks, it was originally March. Now it looks like uh, it's going to start towards the end of August and I'll go back to work maybe in November if all goes well. Um, but but all four, the, the Screen Actors Guild and the uh, IATC, the Teamsters and the Directors Guild, um, all of the major unions got together and hammered out a joint set of protocols to figure out how to make the workplace as safe as possible to so that work could start again. Um, and they've been working on that since 
March, and now that that some states look like they might be able to to open up again in that way, they're prepared and they have these protocols in place that they hope will be effective. And I haven't seen the same kind of thing. Those those conversations might be happening between equity and um, the musicians union and that kind of thing, but I don't see it. And I haven't seen, you know, producing groups sort of lobbying Congress for, for support for performing artists and stuff. I, there have been more kind of grassroots roots campaigns to do that, but there hasn't been an organized kind of thing that I've seen. And that's a little frustrating. I hope it's going on and I just don't know about it, but because it's really going to be necessary. I mean, our business is scraping by on a, on a good day, you know, yeah. but on the other hand, people in my business are kind of resilient. Like you're born, you, you start in the business knowing that you're going to be unemployed more than you're employed. So you, you get your survival skills at an early stage too. So there's that. Speaking of which you, you kind of grew up in a, uh, in a performing family. Wasn't your dad uh, a, a yeah. music teacher? Is that right? Yeah. In fact, you, at some point you may hear his piano wafting through the, the door in a little while. I'm, I'm staying with him in Pittsburgh right now. And, uh, um, and he's still, he's retired for, I don't know how long now, but he still plays piano for six to eight hours a day and just is learning new music and practicing. And, um, you know, he devoted, devoted his whole life to, to teaching in uh, college, mostly in universities in West Virginia and, uh, and Arizona and Pennsylvania. And, um, uh, and my mom, he and my mom met at Juilliard. She was a modern dancer. And my sister danced in the New York City Ballet with George Balanchine and, and my brother's a uh, stage and TV actor. So, you know, they tried sending us to good schools, hoping that we would, you know, get a real career. But, uh, but we somehow all ended up <laughs> making a go of it in, in the arts. Yeah, I saw you went to Yale. Did your parents think, oh, well, I've got a doctor and lawyer now? No, but you ended <laughs> think, up being king think, of Broadway. I think they were hoping, you know. I mean, I, I thought about, I applied to a bunch of different places. I applied to some like conservatory kind of things, but I think I'd, I'd, I'd grown up with a healthy uh, respect for how difficult it was to have a professional career in the arts. So, I wanted to go to school where I was going to get a full education and not just be doing, you know, acting classes and stuff. Um, and so Yale, yeah, I think, I think, I think their hope was that I might just kind of get sucked into the law school or something, you know? <laughs> so they made you, uh, your dad, I read someplace that your dad made you uh, for one year play an instrument and right. you started off with what? I started off with the violin um, I think this was fourth grade. And, uh, and of course, now I wish I had kept it up because, you know, I'd love having fiddle players in our band. Loose Cattle always has a fiddle player in the band. And, um, and uh, but fourth grade, it wasn't really the cool instrument to play. For some reason, they, they told me that they thought I should uh, switch to cello, which I also wish I had learned to play because I love the cello. I think it's beautiful. Well, chicks um, dig cello, so you know. Yeah, and, and Michael, <laughs> you're way ahead of us in the fourth grade, and they're considering cello. We had the recorder. Remember the recorder? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The slap. Yeah, you're way ahead. No wonder you went to Yale. I mean, we were <laughs> yeah. way ahead of it. Yeah, well, I don't know. This was in West Virginia, so you know, oh, there, was, okay. there was nothing that, that looked like I was headed to Yale when I was there. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, I you know I I decided that I wanted to learn guitar, which seemed like a much cooler thing. So I finished out my year learning guitar, and then I put it away for a couple of years, I think, um, and then you know pulled it out from under my bed one day and kind of sort of remembered some of the stuff I had learned, and but then really kind of retaught myself just from scratch and. So I feel like I'm pretty much a self-taught musician because I, I didn't really study. And it's, it's the thing that kept me for the longest time from thinking of myself as any kind of musician because I had the example of my dad, who to me is a musician and, you know, was studied and trained and dedicated for years. And I just kind of, you know, sat with the radio and played things over and over again until they weren't painful to listen to, you know. Yeah. So is your brother also a musician? He plays, uh, he's picked up the ukulele. 
Um, he also, you know, started out on, I think we all actually started on piano at home with our dad, but it's hard to learn from a parent in your house, you know? Um, and he, he stuck with it. He switched to flute at some point and played that for a while. Um, my grandfather was a flautist for the Pittsburgh symphony. He came over from, uh, Italy and, um, and then went into the, the U S army, partly because he wanted to play in a music ensemble. He wanted to play in the army band and, you know, ended up getting shipped off to the front, which was right. really, really not the plan, but. So this was your dad's dad? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, music has been in my family for generations and, uh, and Todd, Todd sings, he's done some musicals and, um, and, and plays ukulele um, for, for himself and, and me when I really, you know, drag it out of him. Is that just because the harp was too too big to get through the front door? Or? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, we, we were going to have a band at one point when we were younger. Um, we decided we were going to have a band and call it Fratricide. <laughs> we are going to start a brother, a brother punk band. So when did you start Loose Cattle? Um, we started in 2011. Um, my girlfriend at the time, Kimberly Kay, and I, um, she had, when I met her, she was a, a, a arts journalist. Um, um, and it kind of uh, was revealed a while into our dating that she actually had gone to college, to Wagner College, to be a performer. Um, she played trumpet and she sang and acted and um, but she had that kind of discouraged from her by a, a teacher um, and went into writing instead. And, um, but I would hear her like kind of sing, you know, around the house and stuff. And, and I said, well, you're crazy. You have a great voice, you know, you should sing. And so we decided to start this band really just for fun, just for, just to, <laughs> we told ourselves that we were starting the band so that it would keep us from arguing and from fighting because we would have this band to do like we had clearly never read any Fleetwood Mac bios or anything else, you know, thinking that that having a band is the way to keep a relationship together. So harmonious, of course. Yeah. Um, so we started it and got a couple friends together and it was supposed to just be a laugh and play and, you know, in friends living rooms and that kind of thing. And um and the name we picked from, uh, I was doing a, a gig with a singer named Laura Cantrell at this place called Hill Country, this barbecue place in New York. And on the wall, there's a photograph that has a text. It's all like Texas Hill Country, you know, mer memorabilia. And there's a sign on the wall in a photograph that is warning people about loose livestock, which is a problem when you're driving across Texas, I guess. Yeah. And um and I yeah. misremembered it as loose cattle, but it kind of described what our goals were with this band. You know, we weren't going to practice. We weren't going to learn stuff. We would just like tell everybody what songs we were going to play. Everybody just sort of figure them out and scratch them on a piece of paper. And then we'll just get together and play them. Cause I'd been, I'd had so many bands playing my own stuff that I'd written. And it was just like endless rehearsals and teaching somebody new music. And by the time we got to, the gig after I had like called clubs to find us a thing and got rehearsals together. And by the time we got on stage, I was just kind of worn out and too tired to do the one thing I actually enjoyed in the whole process, which was actually playing with people. So we thought we're going to foreground the fun part and not worry about the rest. And somehow ironically got further doing that and eventually said, well, maybe we should actually practice and maybe we should actually learn some things since we're playing at Lincoln Center and we're playing on mountain stage and we're playing, you know, opening for Arlo Guthrie. Maybe we should know what we're doing. You know, I bet you, if you come to Texas, we can get you into the uh, broken spoke downtown in Austin. Yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty oh, sure. I would love nothing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nothing yeah, yeah. More. And Michael, I have a, I won't forget. I'm going to send you when we're done. Um, uh, we took vacation a few years ago and we're way out in West Texas and uh, I, I'm just walking down a Texas country road in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden we come upon a sign and it said loose cattle and it was turned upside down. So I'll send you that picture. I took a oh, picture man. Yeah. Put it on your album. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to say we've got a record that we were going to put out in yeah. April and we're putting it off that 
that may be the album cover. I will send it to you. But <laughs> but uh, speaking of music, I, before I forget, I want to throw this at you. Um, first of all, before you came on, Jim and I were talking about how do you remember your lines? I mean, you've got a ton of dialogue. All the, We don't know how you did it. And, I mean, you did Tommy. I want to show you this. Speaking of music, uh, this is a – can you see that? There's yeah, my yeah. ticket for yeah, the yeah. Who. Yeah. And I told Jimbo it was 79. It's actually 82. I saw the oh, Who man. in 82 in the Astrodome. I keep tickets. I'm a pack rat. If yeah. you look at right behind him, you see his, his collage. Yeah, I got my, well, this is yeah. some, but, but yes, I, I, my 97 rock, there's the, the sticker. That's whatever. Yeah. Did, but, but anyway, I was like, yes, we're going to have Tommy on. I want to hear all about this. Well, I got, um, it's funny, funny you should mention that. I've been, one of the things I've been spending all my time doing here, being at my dad's is, um, going through all these boxes that have been in his basement forever. And I'm, I'm such a pack rat and I keep all, I've got like 500 band t-shirts that I just, you know, unearthed and I've been going through and finding all these photographs and stuff. And yeah. I just, just found this. Oh, I don't want to. Oh, look wow. at that. Look at that. And me and me and Pete Townsend singing on, oh, on his, uh, his tour. Um, oh, wow. But then I also have this from junior high school. <laughs> <laughs> Spring show. Yeah, that's Detroit Rock City, isn't it? It, it totally is. It totally is. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, let's see that picture again. Which this one, one is you? Uh, I'm the Ace Fraley one. You're the Ace Fraley. Look at the. No, is that the real hair or is that the wig? That's that's my actual hair with some silver spray in it. I think. Can you see? Oh yes, you can see the the, Look at the that. shoes with aluminum foil on them. <laughs> oh my goodness so so michael you did that was your you grew up did you listen to rock what was your oh, yeah. your dad played piano but what music did you gravitate toward as you got older well you know that was the thing my dad was playing classical music all the time right. and um and i was i was listening to now this is this is the 70s in in west virginia pre mtv and stuff so like you're getting 70s radio but 70s radio was awesome yes and you know and it was it was really varied too like the first record i ever bought the first 45 i bought was the jimmy castor bunch troglodyte so my first <laughs> This little scrawny white kid in West Virginia, the first record I bought was this funk record. And, but was I was it, like, was it, was it 45, 78 album? It, what it was, was 45. It? Okay. It was 45. Um, and, um, and then, but then I was also listening to like, you know, Don McLean and, and Ario Speedwagon. And, and I was a huge Deep Purple fan. Um, oh. I remember Kansas coming through and, trying to convince my dad that no but you know they have a violin player in the band so you know it's there's not it's and emerson emerson lake and palmer did you know pictures at an exhibition you know they're playing mazorgsky and he was like yeah that's not mazorgsky yeah, don't get don't get you started about jethro toll and the flautist yeah Come on. i'm saying wow so yeah it was like classic rock and and i was really not not terribly into country music you know i, I wasn't into the music that was around me. I wanted, you know, something else. Um, but I was also, I didn't have an older brother. So I kind of came later to uh, the who and the stones and everything. I, my first music was just what was on the radio. Um, so, so I kind of then went into my more classic rock phase. Um, and then for, I had a long period, I guess more in the, in the, 80s and and into the 90s of being a huge british like goth and smiths and uh you know brit pop and all of that i was like really really into yeah killing um, joke and the smiths yes, yeah I remember, and, absolutely and, and, joy uh, division black, black, i mean black uh -huh. flag is way out there but yes i remember yeah oh my goodness wow and then um and and then I, it was funny because I, I was really into to that and my early, I'm starting to release some of the first music that I wrote and recorded um, that's so much more big guitars and, and, you know, punk and power pop kind of stuff and the kind of stuff that 
led me to playing with Bob Mold. Um, but it was after, a little bit after that, I guess, um, that I went down to New Orleans and that trip, I'd always listened, you know, I'd heard country music because I grew up around it, um, but I've never really spent much time with it. And when I, I drove down to, to New Orleans when I was doing that first job, and it was the first time I'd been below the Mason-Dixon since I had grown up. And I didn't realize what had been missing for so long. But when I started going down south, and, you know, granted, New Orleans is a whole different kind of south than, than West Virginia. In fact, most of the south doesn't even think of West Virginia as the south. Um, but, uh, but just being there kind of reminded me of this whole part of myself that I had kind of just been neglecting for a long time. And I started listening to a lot more country music and, um, and, uh, and that was that and playing it then. And that was kind of how, when Kimberly and I decided to put this band together, that that was the music that I wanted to play. And, um, and she hadn't grown up on it, but she always loved, you know, great storytelling and in, in song and, you know, that's what country music is. So, um, so that's, that's how Loose Cattle kind of developed. And, you know, we're involving and starting, we're really more of an Americana band than a, than a country band. But, um, but, but I'm also, the longer we go on, the less I care about being any particular lane. And most of the, most of the artists I like, even the most, uh, you know, genre specific, are really pretty broad in their own personal tastes as I've gotten to know, you know, musicians, like even the staunchest uh, country musician will listen to, you know, a show tune now or then, or, you know, listen to, you know, pop radio or something um, and, and have people in jazz that they like or something. So, so I've gotten less uptight about, you know, what we should sound like and, and, and also now that we have the band now is includes um, uh, Renee Komen and Doug Garrison from the Iguanas, um, who are a band in New Orleans that play like a lot of uh, Southwest and, and Mexican influenced stuff along with New Orleans uh, style stuff. And, um, and our fiddle player, Rorick Noonan is from the Whiskey Gentry. And so, you know, I'm, I like having everybody's own personal music taste kind of coming in. And um, we just recorded, a cover of um, Fear is a Man's Best Friend, which is a John Cale song from his first solo record after the Velvet Underground, which is not, you know, an Americana record, although they were certainly an American band and, you know, working in, in pop idioms too. So, but, you know, ours has a fiddle in it. So I actually so have it queued up. Can we, can we listen to a little bit of it? Oh yeah, sure. All right, hang on. Stand by. I got to push buttons. Standing, waiting for man to show Wide-eyed, one-eye fixed on the door This waiting's killing me It's wearing me down Day in, day out My feet are burning holes in the ground Darkness warmer than a bedroom floor Want someone to hold me close forevermore I'm a sleeping dog But you can't tell But I'm on the prowl You better run like hell You know it makes sense don't even think about it Life and death Are things you just do when you're bored Say
Now, did you all, did you record that at, remotely? Yeah, it's each one of us recording our own parts from, you know, our own homes and, and sending it, uh, you know, like I, I did the uh, temp vocal and guitar track and I sent it to the drummer and then he sent it back to me and I sent it to the bass player and then our friend David Barbie uh, mixed it all down in Athens and, uh, and, and it's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, this wouldn't have been possible uh, even like five years ago. It would have been well, Technology hard. is amazing, you know? Yeah. You yeah. don't need to be in a $100,000 studio anymore, you know? No, and think, think how many bands probably could be together still if they wouldn't have had to be in the same room together, you know? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, that's a beautiful uh, video. And there she is. There's Evie. That's the star. You got to tell us about Evie. Um, Evie, well, I had a dog for, for 16 years named Gibson, who was my constant companion. She was a rescue uh, that I got in New York. Um, she had passed away some years ago and it had been a few years and I was really finally feeling ready to have another dog again. And, um, and I found this place called uh, Southern Paws Rescue. They're based in New Jersey, but they go down south and go to kill shelters and try to rescue as many dogs as possible and bring them up north. And, um, and so Evie happened to come from uh, the Louisiana-Mississippi border, and she'd just been left in a parking lot by somebody, and she and her sister. And I really wanted to adopt both of them, but I didn't know if I could take care of two dogs on, on a, you know, actor schedule. Um, so I tried to find a friend who could adopt her sister, at least so that they could grow up together. And that didn't work out either. But, um, but I did adopt Evie and she was a couple week, couple months old when I first saw her. And then by the time I adopted her, she was, I guess, three months old and, um, and came up and she's been to every backstage and movie and TV set and is, you know, more popular and welcome every place than I am ever. But she loves traveling and she loves just adventure and stuff. So it's been great. When we met you in 2015, that's, I heard you took her to the, to the theater all the time. So yeah, we were, we were expecting to see her. So we, we show up and we look around and, you know, not to meet Michael because, you know, we are there to see Evie. We, we asked, well, where's Evie? <laughs> exactly. Well, she's the more interesting of the two of us anyway. <laughs> and he said, well, I didn't know I was supposed to bring her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure she just probably had the night off. Her her contract was always better than mine. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you did your own makeup. Is that is that common? Yeah, it is on stage. Um, unless it's some specialty kind of makeup, they usually expect the actors to do it. You'll have a hair person to kind of do, you know, keep the wigs in shape and stuff. Um, but, uh, and and even when you, like with Hedwig, I was taught to do the makeup first and then I did it myself after a while. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's a common thing. Not <clears throat> in TV and film, you wouldn't ever do your, right, right. your own makeup. Although, you know, who knows in the, the new yeah. age, how that might change. So let's see here, Michael, do you have eyebrows? Um, I do. I okay, do. Good. Good. You know, no thanks to JJ Abrams who decided on because that, this character was so interesting. When I auditioned, it was with a, a fake scene that ended up not ever being in the show, but they just needed something to, you know, have people read. Because the original idea was to have that character not be revealed until like the end of the first season or so. And the whole season, you would just see him in these little clips and they would hope that the audience would be just like dying to find out, you know, who this was well apparently they were dying to find out by episode four because they moved it up really fast but they hadn't made a lot of decisions when i came in for my wardrobe fitting the wardrobe uh designer said so um so what do you think he wears i'm like Don't, shouldn't you be telling me that <laughs> yeah and, and they said well we have you know the instructions we got were he's got to be able to blend into a crowd and maybe seem like he's a little out of place, but not anything that anybody would really notice. So we got, you know, all of these suits, you know, is there anything you like in particular? So I found this one that I sort of liked. And, and they said, do you think he has like a coat or a hat? And I said, well, yeah, let's look 
for a hat. So we tried these different hats on and, and I chose that fedora. And, you know, luckily I chose things that I liked because I wore them for five years. Yeah, um, so, so here's the, let, let me ask you this question, Michael. So they have you at like a major league baseball all-star game. They have you yeah. at NASCAR. They have you at football game. And I'm, is this real or did they actually fly you to green screen you in? How did they yeah, no, that? I was, I was there. And, and they, there you are. Yeah. And it used to piss off Joshua Jackson so much. Oh yeah. Because he's there, you know, working his butt off on set for 12, 15 hours a day, every day. And I'm just like flying out to the Texas Speedway <laughs> to, to do a NASCAR race and going to, you know, American Idol or standing on the sidelines of an yeah. NFC championship game. And the best thing was that you had to know the show for it to mean anything to you really it was really it was really a, an easter egg present for fans of the show already because if you didn't know the show you would just think who is that weird guy who's standing you know at the all-star game and but they wouldn't tell you and the announcers were were told not to comment on it so it was more just kind of expanding the the idea of the show in this meta kind of way for the people who are already fans of it. But it wasn't really going to lead people unless they, you know, Googled weird bald guy at NASCAR, you know. Right. And, you know, God knows you get all kinds of things with that kind of Google search. Um, yeah. Well, that, but, that, that's what's interesting is I'm looking at this and I'm like, he's in the pit crew standing <laughs> I, did they bring a camera crew with him to shoot that? And then yeah. they've got you like at the all-star game in baseball and you've got the greatest seat. Yeah. And then, you, then you're standing on the sidelines with like the Cowboys and the Packers. And I'm like, <laughs> How did, what? I'm just trying to get an audition. Jim and I can't. Yeah. We just. How, I know how, it was, it was the best gig in the world. I loved, I loved that show. I loved everybody involved with it. I loved going to Vancouver to fit with the first year was in New York, but then after that we're in Vancouver. I, I, I just loved everything about it. And I'm so proud of what it was too, because it really is a great, great series. Um, but also this promotional campaign thing was just like the sweetest gig oh. ever. And you never blinked in five years. <laughs> no. Exactly. No, oh, but what I was going to start to say, well, that's funny because at American Idol, they they didn't want, they wanted me to react as though I were the observer at these events. So, wow. you know, just sort of processing everything and not really, and I was seated next to the family of one of the contestants. And of course, the whole thing is everybody cheers for their person. And they didn't really explain to the crowd either. They just would sort of say, you know, don't, don't pay attention to them and don't. Don't look at him. Um, he's doing a thing. I don't think they even necessarily said anything about Fringe or if people would have known what it was at that point. So everybody else is cheering their heads off and I'm just sort of sitting there. And during commercial breaks, I would have to turn to the family and say, I think he's great. I think he's really terrific. I just, I can't, I'm not allowed to applaud, but I want you to know, I really think he's going to win. I think he's the best. Great. I felt Mr. so apologetic. horrible. That's great. That's great. Because when you see these still shots, you're like, <laughs> yeah, you're just, exactly. And I, I would I would have loved to know what's going on in your head. Oh man. Well, I'm the luckiest guy in the world is what was going through my head. So and glad that I was able to talk them out of shaving my eyebrows, which was their first idea. Yeah. That's why I brought that up was, yes, yes he has eyebrows. But yeah. uh, the question I had is one of the things, and, and again, I'm sucked in now. I'm watching, I'm all into this and, and, and I'll, I'll watch more of it, but there's scenes where you're like, you're just catching bullets. <laughs> like people are trying to kill you and you're just catching them. And there's another scene where you, um, you beat, these guys are robbing some place yeah. and you beat them up. And this poor lady, she can't breathe. And you get right. her inhaler out mm -hmm. and you help her. But then you take the inhaler. <laughs> right. And I'm like, well, I'm like, you know, I'm there. I'm there to number, observe go, and to go back. <laughs> Don't give it back to her. Well, you know, the whole the whole reason that this series happens is because I interfere and, you know, disrupt the, the flow of time. So okay. you know, my my mere my mere presence is a problem to begin with. Okay. I see. Wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm gonna watch. I'm that it looks exciting and what a gig. 
What's really funny is it's a real, um, I've had so many father and daughter combos come up and tell me that it was their show growing up that they always watched together. A lot of, a lot of younger women who would say, you know, this was a show that my dad and I always watched together, which I think makes a lot of sense when I think about it. I mean, it's a great sci-fi series and the, you know, on that level, it's really satisfying, but it's also really great parents and children kind of like so many of the stories are about versions of fathers and sons or, you know, mothers and, and daughters. And, um, so I think that's part of its appeal is that it it's not just a sci sci fi show and it's it really has a lot of human uh, aspects to it and I loved it. I've been thinking that I should go back and watch it again because I watched it all at the time yeah. you know I was a fan of it too but uh, but your character's good though right yeah and I always thought of him as good yeah they didn't give me a lot of information like I was saying. Um, you know, all of his mannerisms and stuff, most of them, the way he sort of like tilts his head and, you know, listens, that's, that's from watching my dog try to understand what I'm saying to her. I know, but Michael, you scare the heck out of me. Well, I know. He, got he, this, he seems... I don't know what's in your mind. If you're thinking about your dog, great. But to me, especially <laughs> when you looked at that lady in the diner and you said no, yeah. like, I was like, I can't watch this. this I know. I mean, that's a, if they turned you bad, yeah. That would that would be well, and you know you'll see not not all observers are good. Okay, okay, got it, got yeah. it. But uh, but that was the interesting thing. I assumed I was good, and you know weird, but I didn't actually know until really like the last season that I mean there are hints before that I suppose, but um, but I think part of the idea was to not be certain is he on their side or not? And is he going to help them or not? And sometimes the way he helped didn't look like it was helping. So. Okay. So tell us about some of the projects you have coming up right now. You said uh, the HBO uh, uh, show. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I'm not allowed to say the name of it yet still. Um, but, um, but it's going to be really exciting and could be, should be one of those ones that will be like years of work for a lot of people, which will be really great. Um, and there's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, we're supposed to shoot it between uh, August and um, April, I think, um, which I guess means maybe it'll be on next fall. But, um, and there's a, an indie film that I was supposed to do also in March here in Pittsburgh. And that, supposedly is going to happen sometime, but I've kind of gotten out of the habit of making any plans now at this point. So only things that I can control. So things like recording these songs with the band and we've got another two songs. We've got one original song called Eating Birthday Cake Alone. That's uh, kind of our our COVID anthem. And, um, and then we're also doing a cover of the Bill Withers song, Grandma's Hands. Um, and so we're working on those. And then we've got this whole album that we just have to figure out when is the right time to do it. We wanted to do it and do a tour and, you know, go play it around and stuff. And, you know, it's going to be a while before we can do that. So we have to decide, do we want to wait till we can do that, even if it's next year? Or do we want to just put it out and, you know, and just go with that? So we'll see. I really do hope we make it out to Texas. I mean, Texas is a, our spiritual home and, uh, and I think we'd have a great time being there, and especially Austin. I mean, I haven't been back to Austin for a long time. My, my sadly recently ex-girlfriend is from Austin and is there now, and, and she would talk about it all the time. And even though it's changed a lot from when she grew up, um, it always made me want to get back there. So, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to make that a priority whenever we do get to get on the road again. Well, I actually live in the Hill Country, so we can give you a tour of the oh, Hill Country when it well, comes out. perfect. So. Perfect. We can we can stand in front of those loose cattle signs and take pictures. Yeah, exactly. And this just hit me. You, uh, J.J. Abram and Star Wars. Michael, you might want to make your way toward. The I, you know, I've been I've been saying, you know, like I, clearly I'm willing to shave or, you know, alter my eyebrows at least. Uh, <laughs> You know, I maybe could, I can be a Vulcan. Maybe you know? if you picked up a flute, maybe that would kind of close the deal. <laughs> maybe. Just Whatever it takes. <laughs> JJ, if you're listening, I'm ready. Well, Michael, um, thank you. Thanks for just letting us geek out and have fun with you. And oh, 
Thanks for having and, me. Uh, nice. And uh, please, I mean, if you if we get to some sort of normalcy in the world, uh, please come to Austin. We'll this is the live music capital of the world, as you know, and um, we appreciate you coming on today. I'm I'm so happy to be there. And you know, I mean, if I don't think we need to wait for the world to get normal because keeping Austin weird is the whole thing, right? So, you know, save one of my favorite bands. Austin. What's that? Uh, keeping Austin normal and saving Ferris. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, isn't Glass Eye was was Glass Eye an a uh, uh, Austin band from like the mid nineties? I feel um, like I feel like you know Jimbo. Were. I don't. Oh, was no, that, what's that was movie? Like, what's that um, movie? Slacker. That Slackers. Slacker. That it, they were in. Slacker. They were in Slackers. Or Slacker. Okay. To watch it again, and then Dazed yeah. and Confused. We had a guy on last week that was in Dazed and Confused. No way. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so um, he was shirtless. Yeah, so we, you know, he he yeah. had the, the bar was. Oh, really that's what you're saying. Yeah. Which was normal here in Austin. <laughs> that's right. 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 But, well, there uh, you go. Well, you guys are clearly the coolest podcast in town. Oh, there you go. Well, stick around. We want promos from you. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let, uh, let me just add, um, uh, Michael and, and everybody, thanks for joining us today on the Jimbo and Jeff podcast. And just a reminder, you can catch all your episodes on your favorite podcasting app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or you can directly go to jimboandjeff.com. Remember to like and subscribe on YouTube. We're Jimbo and Jeff on YouTube. Also hit the bell icon to be notified of any uh and when our next video is going to come out you can also email us at jimbo and jeff at jimbo and jeff.com once again michael thank you for joining us uh will you please join us again in the future near future I absolutely will well if you come yeah. to texas we'll definitely go for barbecue yes absolutely well, then who needs a better reason than that well we really yeah. just want to see evie but you know <laughs> yeah well she'll be there yeah and and michael best of continued success to you you're that's fantastic and um keep us posted on how you're doing i will thanks y'all the jimbo and jeff show the jimbo and jeff show